five, boys. Hello. Hello and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know podcast, the podcast about classical stuff you should know from us, your hosts who know classical stuff you should know. Um, my name is Graham Donaldson and I am a teacher of English literature and rhetoric at Veritas Academy in Austin, Texas. And I'm joined today with AJ Hannenberg. That's me. And Thomas Magby. Hello. Also teachers and workers at Veritas Academy in Austin, Texas. And boys, yep. this is our spring break this podcast. Is spring break. Yeah. Yeah. Woo, spring break. So the way we celebrate spring break, day number one of spring break is sitting together for a few hours to record some podcasts. Spring yeah. break podcast. And then I get a grade later. That's <laughs> my whole program. So that explains why AJ is not wearing a shirt. Wait, what? Because it's spring break podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Woo. Um, and this podcast is not coming to you live from any sort of party beach. <laughs> Nope. Although that you know of, that we know of, yeah. maybe on the second spring break next year, spring break, we will come to you live from Daytona Beach. I don't know. I find or, that the older I get, the less I want to go to a oh, party beach. Like I'm just especially like, during you know, spring break, right? Like what, earlier, but be like, let's go party on the beach. I'd be like, yeah. And now I'm just like, you know, I'm kind of tired. <laughs> there is nothing rather... about a crowded <laughs> hot beach uh, with people. With a lot of a lot of drunk folks. With a lot of drunk folks, that is any way remotely. Did that ever to appeal me. to you? And I don't yeah, think it yeah, ever appealed. Yeah, to me. it was never really my program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe if there was a good band playing, I mm -hmm. might go for a little while. Anyway, that's maybe that's a whole other podcast. We can delve into the, <laughs> delve into <laughs> our, why our that is the habits. way it is. Yeah. Graham, I was also going to say I like how whenever you start the podcast, you always start with a hello, like you're <laughs> like you're walking into a Canadian bank. Like <laughs> that's how <laughs> we greet each other. This is how we greet each other. It's. <laughs> Is that specific to Canadian banks? That feels like I, I'm just imagining a a Graham. <laughs> it's one of our friendly walking places. in with a furry hat. <laughs> yep, hello. <laughs> and they're like, "Oh, hey, welcome. We have all your money." <laughs> um, and today, so our podcast is being uh, has been prepared meticulously and lovingly by our host for today, AJ Hannenberg. He is going to be like a Virgil, mm. and we, but young fledgling Dante, so mm. he will take us by the hand as he takes us through this hell and purgatory that he is about that is about to be stretched out in front of us. And hopefully our audience will understand all of those references by the end of the podcast. And if you don't know yet, by the end, you'll yeah, know them all. Yeah, listen know. to the entire episode, then come back to the beginning to understand this. It's, uh, it's meta. Yeah. Okay. Today, I, we've, we've spent a, a while talking about random concepts and having some conversations, and I, I wanted to kind of take it back towards just like, here are some facts, here's an introduction to a book that you can dive into. And we've referenced Dante quite a few times on this podcast, and I don't think we've ever given you the full rundown of who he is or what he did or the whole picture that he painted in his comedy. So Dante was a fellow that lived in Italy, specifically in Florence, uh, and they think it was he lived from 1265 to 1321 because of some weird datings of his books, right? Mm. He talks about being midway through his life when, and the, and the fictional year for that is 1300. And so like midway through his life was clearly 35. Mm. So they think he was 35 <laughs> at 1300 and that's how they date his birth. I'm but, not kidding. There's only one way to know if you're midway through your life. When you're dead. Yeah, you're right. dead. Yeah, good. Well, he, they think because the average lifespan was about 70 oh, years gotcha. that he just hit it right in the middle there. And that seems like an awfully spurious way to <laughs> date. Like, surely he was born this year because he would have been 35 in the year 1300. Seems goofy to me. But we don't actually know. We don't actually know when he was born. I mean, I, I could look, but I, no, I'm just... on, on my research, that's what it that's what I got to is that they, they are extrapolating back to 1265 from yeah. the year 1300 being him 35 years old. And is that... Is that his intro or when he's talking about himself at the beginning of Inferno that he says halfway yeah, through my life? Yeah, he says, and, and so even then... It I, could be a fiction. Like, it could just be a... That's what I was going to say. It uh, might not really be him. A, a conceit. Yeah. yeah, it could be a fictional thing. And even, like, maybe he didn't have a specific year in mind, right? Yeah. If I talk about midway through my life, I'm thinking, like, 36 <laughs> through, like, 48. There's, like, a range, right? 48 seems high yeah, well, for midway. For halfway through, yeah. 55 is my mid. My mid. You're, You're the 110? 110? Yeah, 110, yeah. guys. Good. Yeah. Well, good luck. All right. <laughs> You know that Science if I, if I ever way. lived to like a hundred years old and like the news came to my house and they were like, hey, how did you live so long? I am going to troll people so hard. I'm going to make like, stuff up. I ate an acorn, mm. no, a pine cone mm. every day. Yeah. Whole. 
I swallowed a whole pine cone. You could sell a self help book on that <laughs> exactly. one. Yeah, and that people would be like, "Oh man, this sucks." The pine cone method. You know, there's going to be some Canadians up there. They're like, "I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Been doing it for years." All right. How does he keep his youth? <laughs> All right. So he was born and he he lived in Florence for a good chunk of his life. His dad was associated with one of the political parties there, the the Guelphs, uh, and they fought against the Ghibellines and. His dad was not important I enough. I love these names. Sorry. Guelphs, Guelphs and Ghibellines. Ghibellines? Yeah. And I think the, the Ghibelline was like named after a castle and Guelphs was something else. They, they come from Germany. Huh. Um, and they're weirdly associated to like kings and popes. We'll get there. So his okay. dad wasn't important enough to have been exiled in the, <laughs> the coups. Right? And may we all be that unimportant. <laughs> to not I know. Be exiled, so yeah. when they throw a big government coup, they're going to toss all the dudes out that disagree with them. And his but dad was not... Not one of those. Not an important person enough to be tossed out. Huh. Because right before, or like or the year after he was born, that's when they had this really big war and all of the Ghibellines were kicked out of Florence, right? So the Guelphs won. Mm. And so he grew up in a Florence that was really feeling itself, mm. you know? They had just mm. sort of solidified. Everybody was unified. They wanted to sort of flex their economic muscles. And he grew up in sort of the, you know, the heyday of Florence. And unfortunately, as politics will do, they split eventually into the white Guelphs and the black Guelphs. Oh. And the difference between the original parties was that the Ghibellines were in support of the Roman emperor, like having a king. And the, the Guelphs were in support of the papacy, right? They wanted the pope to be in charge. And so the Guelphs won, got the Pope in charge, and eventually the blacks and whites split, and the blacks continued to support the Pope, and then Dante actually went with the whites and thought that the Pope's desire for power and for land and for money was not becoming of a Pope and someone in power. And so he actually didn't like the Pope very much. So who did the white Guelphs want in charge? I think they were hoping for a Roman emperor. In fact, Dante mm -hmm. talks about he wants the return of Rome, because partially because that's the conditions under which Christ came, mm. and he thought that if we could recreate that, Christ would come again. So, but the Ghibellines wanted the Holy Roman Emperor. You said they wanted the emperor from, from Germany? Or they wanted no, I, a king? I, I think they wanted, it. they wanted a king. They resisted yeah. the, the Pope. Gotcha. Right? They were wealthy artisans and saw, you know, the empire as a way to further their own, you know, their own interests. Gotcha. All right, so <coughs> around 1283, when he was 18 or so, he married a lady named Gemma Donati, and he had been betrothed for a long time to her. This was not, you know, his own necessary choice. And it was shortly after that that, or sorry, before that, when he was nine, that he met a girl named Beatrice. Mm. I think that's the Americanization of it, because I think the original name in Latin is Bice, B-I-C-E. Huh. And he... <laughs> And it's <laughs> an unfortunate name. To be, yeah, it yeah, really yeah. is. I'm trying Beatrice to avoid the jokes. Beatrice is a great translation. Yeah, so we're going to stick with Beatrice. <laughs> uh, and he he was really into this lady, right? He loved her at first sight, and whenever she'd talk to him, he'd sort of freeze up, and he'd feel really bad if she didn't say hi. And they that, didn't really know each other that well. That's when you know you well. got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he this this love affair with her will kind of, kind of continue on. He writes about her in a bunch of poems. He writes about her even in The Inferno, which we'll get to in a minute. But he has this sort of transcendental courtly love for her. He idolizes this woman. And she died when she was young. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't really have the chance to go anywhere with it. And I don't think he really intended to. And a lot of people point out that he doesn't talk about his wife in his poetry. That's what I was going to ask. So he talks about Be uh, Beatrice a lot, but doesn't talk about his wife? Yeah, okay. doesn't talk about his wife. He, he has some kids. He doesn't really talk about those. He Even if he refers to his sister, he talks about, like, her to whom I am closest related by blood. Oh, it's wow. really vague yeah. and kind of obscure. And they point to that as maybe a way of saying he didn't like his wife very much. And I think that's hogwash, right? You, Someone you don't like, you're going to write about, <laughs> and you're going to make them look bad in yeah. fiction. And I think probably what happened is his wife just said, "Hey, keep me out of it, mm. right? Don't don't write about me. I don't want to. I don't want to be hearing about our relationship in your poetry because that's if I was going to write that's personal. Yeah, yeah, if I was going to keep someone out of my writing, that would be out of respect and love more than it would be out of hatred. And his love of Beatrice is not like a, a burning romantic love. He saw he ends up kind of turning her into this pillar of all that is good and beautiful and exactly. God's agent of beauty on earth and that kind of thing. He attaches to her a lot of extra <clears throat> meaning. And I, and even to reduce it to the level of lust, mm -hmm. I think would have been to dirty his love for her, gotcha. right? It, it wouldn't be the right kind of thing. All right, so it would so, also be worse for his marriage if he had put his wife in that position, right? Of exactly. all that extra weight uh, mm -hmm. that she would have to live up to. And so she didn't have to, and they yep. had kids. And yep. it seems to me like they had a decent home life. 
Uh, so when she died, he kind of turned to philosophy. And weirdly, a- a- as a consolation, and weirdly, he actually turned literally to the consolation of philosophy oh, by yeah. Boethius yeah. that we have talked about a couple of times, times, and I still intend to read and haven't just haven't done yet. And he started going to the public discourses and just got super into philosophy for a while. He joined public life in his 30s. He joined a, a guild. He was an uh, apothecary or... <laughs> He, he wanted to be a pharmacist, yeah. kind of. Oh, cool. And really, they sold books in pharmacies. Oh. And so that was one of the things they sold. So I think part of it was just wanting to be work around and work with and sell books. He started doing a lot of poetry. He'd been do, doing poetry for a long time. And so he was a member of the White Guelphs, right? Did not like the Pope. And eventually, he went to the Pope on an envoy. The, the Pope invited him to come talk hmm. about their situation because the Pope had proposed that a king that he was allied with enter Florence okay. and Dante opposed this and the, and the Pope said, hey, come chat about it. Well, if he stays, he's refusing the Pope and if he goes, he's leaving Florence open. Right. And at this point, he was one of the highest offices in huh. Florence and so he actually went, the Pope was like, <laughs> gotcha, nerd, and detained him Uh-oh. and they entered Florence, ran a coup and the Black Gu- Guelphs you know, ravaged the city for a couple of days, Dang. kicked out all the whites, and in his absence declared that Dante had done all of these crazy, insane crimes that he hadn't done <laughs> and said he has to stand for them. And he was afraid that if he showed up, bad things would happen. Right. And he might be condemned for the crimes that he never committed, <laughs> right? In that kind of political atmosphere. So which pope you gotta is be scared. this? Uh, pope Boniface. <laughs> I think Boniface the seventh? Eighth. Oh. Eighth? Okay. So it was Pope Boniface, and he... Uh, because he doesn't show up, they then declare that he will be burned to death and eff- effectively exile him from Florence. And for right. us, that's not a big deal, right. right? We leave a city. We've still got Facebook. We've still got phone calls. We can talk to the people we left. Yeah. We can probably still have the same career somewhere. Google Earth, man. Just drone that thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You can. Pr- I mean, our cities are big enough that you can probably visit and get away with it and no one's really no. going to, like, yeah, move they, from they the east side to the there. west side mm-hmm. and nobody cares, yeah. right? That's not the case in Florence, right? The communities are small. When he left Florence, he left everything he knew and loved. He left his legacy. He left his home. He left the public life to which he'd become accustomed. This was like tearing his baby out of his arms, right? Mm. He he was rended inside. And from then on, he had to depend on the generosity of patrons, right? He went to Mm. Ravenna and the people who are nice to him, he actually immortalizes in his poetry. And it's like, these people are great. Mm. I think he talks to one in... Purgatory, who's a really <clears throat> nice fella. <clears throat> and so he he really digs these guys, but he writes eventually the Divine Comedy. And the Divine Comedy is the story of an exile coming to his true home, right? At his very base, that's what it is. Uh, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. This might come up later. Why is it called a comedy? Because it ends happily. There you go. Okay, thank you. D- that's the difference between comedy and tragedy. Comedy ends happy, it's tragedy not, goes sad. Yeah, usually comedy does not mean ha-ha funny the entire time. Correct. Okay. It usually starts off... Kind of a bummer and ends real happy, and then a tragedy starts off somewhat contented and happy and ends up kind of super bummer. So I guess yeah. that, so it makes sense why the order is hell, purgatory, heaven, so mm-hmm. that it ends in heaven. Mm-hmm. And often comedies will, I mean, okay. ha-ha comedies will highlight sort of the goofiness of man and their positive characters, and they might be a little silly, but they come out looking pretty good. In tragedies, usually you have one character who is so noble that one of his, one of his traits becomes a flaw, mm-hmm. right? Like in Julius Caesar, it's... Is it ambitious? It's Brutus. No, no, no. It's Brutus, and he is so trusting in honor and in the spirit of Rome that he doesn't see that other men are angling for power, right? He doesn't know that that's what Cassius wants. He thinks everyone will act nobly after the tyrant is removed, and that's not what happens. Even though Cassius has a lean and hungry look? Yeah. That's the only line of Julius Caesar I can remember. (laughs) He just doesn't, he doesn't get it. Yeah. So that's the difference between tragedy and comedy. Sure. Right. So he, he's in exile. He writes this big book and he writes it in a new rhyme scheme that mm. he invented called Terza Rima. And it's triplets, right? So three lines. And then the end of which is like an ABA rhyme scheme. So cat, bag, bat. And then the next one would be BCB. So hag, hag. Uh, box and drag, right? 
And then the next one would, you know, continue that rhyme scheme Something where you take this center line and then you make it the first and third of the next one. And it goes on and you can have as many as you want in any poem. And then it ends with either an e, like uh, an E, so the middle line of the last one or that one in a rhyming couplet. And he invented this and it's partially to reflect some cool mathematical things that are going on in the Inferno. So he invented Terzarima. Really? That's cool. That's cool. Oh, man. Will you explain it? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're jumping into the Inferno now, which he meant to be kind of his magnum opus. And I'll I'll explain the structure and then talk about the story. Did did he write them in this order also? Inferno, then Purgatory, then Paradiso? I don't know. Because I don't know if, like... I, I'm or not even sure scholars out. know. Yeah, like when right. I was looking, it said that they didn't know it, whether it was released in like cantos or sort of all at once. Yeah. I do know that he worked on it for a very long time right. before releasing it. And Thomas. this wasn't his first work, right? right? He did one called the Vita Nuova mm-hmm. that was about his relationship with Beatrice that was just sort of like taking a bunch of poetry from across the years and sticking a narrative around it and then kind of, you know, sticking them all together. Thomas, he lived this. Sorry, he I'm so sorry. He went on this journey. Yeah, when he journey. was 35 years old, exactly. And then he was just writing this down as he went. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Okay. So there are 33 cantos Mm -hmm. in each book or in each section of the Divine Comedy, which is corresponds literally to hell and purgatory and then heaven, right? He's, it is the story of Dante the Pilgrim, who is a little bit different than Dante the Poet, right? The two personalities become kind of melded, but it'd be like me making myself the main character of a book. Mm -hmm. He's not me, but he's pretty close. Yeah. There's a, there are some... But you'd make him like correlations. a little more jacked and a little more clever. And I don't want to be overshadowed by my own character. <laughs> oh, I'd sure make him kind of derpy oh, and, yeah. and give him my worst, worst quality. Or like with Dante, you faint all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So he he takes a tour uh, all the way through what for them was the known universe. If you remember back to our previous episode, the spheres, we talked about how the world was put together. And so for a modern day reader, it seems like he's just going through this weird hell and then a weird mountain and then he's in some weird crystal spheres in the sky with the flower with the what there's like a flower up there right and and for them that was the universe mm-hmm. right he went from from the earth through the earth up a mountain and then into the stars and then eventually traveled all the way to sort of, you know, the end of what was known at the time. So this was a a tour around everything. For us it would be like traveling so far we get to where we see I don't know, the edge of space. Huh. If you're someone who believes in the Big Bang, you'd get to watch the Big Bang, right? Wow. When you hit the edge of light. Yeah. Um, so that's like, what he like did. Like Interstellar? It's yes. Like, it's like going black hole. And you talk about movies for you the You talk out of your bookshelf? No. Wait, spoiler? Wait. You don't talk it. You wiggle books. No, that's exactly right. <laughs> Yeah, you moved out to the right way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So there are uh, 33 books or cantos in each of the three sections. And with an addition of one as an introduction. So mm. book one of mm. the Inferno is an introduction to the entire comedy, not just the Inferno. So it's a hundred. So it's a hundred cantos. Yeah. But it's divided into three sections of 33, mm-hmm. and each of them is written with three lines. And all mm. of this is to reflect the Trinity, mm. right? He, wow. he was kind of in numbers. Numbers were cool, but he didn't want to end with 99. That's a weird <laughs> right. number to end with. So he popped on a canto at <laughs> the beginning, yeah. but each one is 33 books. Yeah. It has 33 lines, and it's all just the repetition of the mm. Trinity, right? And we even have three grand sections. In the in the translations that you... Because you, you teach the Inferno, AJ, in your class, and then, uh, Graham, you're going to teach the Purgatory next year. It has been proposed. Sorry, uh, you might think about doing that one day. In the English translations, do they match that same rhyming scheme yeah, in uh, Italian? So, like, it, it sounds like it's a lot easier in Italian to do that rhyming scheme than it is in English. I don't think the translation I use maintains the rhyme scheme, and I think that's probably a good thing. Right. I find that when English translations try to maintain also the rhyme scheme, oh, man. they sort of mess it up hard. I'm pretty sure there's a famous English translation. I could be very wrong on this, but by Pope that tries to maintain oh, wow. uh, the rhyme scheme. And it, for a long time, was the English translation. Uh, I, I think that's correct. I'm just going off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, I remember reading it and, be, and it's, it's... It's hard. It's janky because you're needing to get those endings right. that rhyme that aren't necessarily like the most important <laughs> word in the sentence. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, so it gets a little weird. What translation uh, yeah. do you read? Mark Musa. Okay. And it's good? Yeah, it's That's great. It's easy for ninth grade readers, and that means everyone, sure. essentially. Yeah, good. And there's lots of great translations. Um, so Yeah, the Mark Musa one has fantastic end notes at the end of every canto mm-hmm. to help you understand what's going on. Dorothy Sayers, who we've talked about in the podcast before on the second Trivium podcast. Uh, she has a very famous... The lo- uh, Lost Tools of Learning. The Lost Tools of Learning. She's got a very famous translation of, of Dante that um, has sort of been... 
used a lot in classical schools. And then there's a brand new one by, oh, his name escapes me, um, but he's a professor. He w- was at Providence, and now he left Providence College, and now he works at some, I think it's like St. Thomas More College. Uh, Anthony Esselin, is that his name? I'm trying to look for it, but it hasn't come up um, yet. Esalen, Esalen, I'm pretty sure that's him. And apparently his review, his uh, translation is getting very good traction of being like maybe the new standard. Oh, all right. And so I picked cool. up the copy of it, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, well, I read, I read the Mark Musa version and it's pretty good. All right, so let's get to the story, right? I've told you essentially the structure and what he narrates is himself, right? Midway in the journey through his life. But when he says his, his life, he actually says our life. Midway through oh. the journey of our life. Wow. I found myself in a wood. And so you are supposed to understand as the reader that this Dante, Dante the Pilgrim, represents everyone, right? He is us. He is you, he's me. And and so we are supposed to understand ourselves going through this journey. What year was this book written? I think he published it right before his death in... Like roughly? 1321. So he worked on it between 1308 and 1321. So the world is ending in 2642. What? Exactly. Halfway, halfway through, through our lives, you when, guys. Oh, God. <laughs> so thir- this is, uh, we know that the Inferno has been, had been published by 1317. Oh, oh my goodness. So there you go. We got a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're fine. We're, yep. yep. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so he, he shows up in this wood and he's not quite sure how he gets there. That's not the important bit. It doesn't really matter. But all he sees is he sees this mountain in front of him. And at the top, there's the sun, the, the star, the sky. And he wants to get up it, but he can't. He's blocked by three animals, the she-wolf the lion, and the leopard. And he's kind of dragging a foot, right? Mm. Like he injured it or something, but it's just heavier and it wants to remain below. And we're supposed to sort of understand that that is our sin, Mm. right? So our sin is holding us, keeping us from ascending the mountain into the stars. And there's also three animals. And so out out of nowhere comes this dude, Virgil. And if if you know anything about the classics, but if you don't, he he wrote the Aeneid Mm. for Rome. And so he is both a representative of the Roman heritage that the Italians had, and he was all about the empire and not the papacy, mm-hmm. right? He, he actually wrote in support of the Roman empire, sort of, and, and he's also a represent, representation of human reason. So he comes and he's like, hey, buddy, I see you're having a lot of trouble with those animals. Beatrice sent me oh, wow. to come and guide you through what I can guide you through, because I've made this journey before, yeah. right? <clears throat> Does he have like a normal... so? Um, you're probably going to start going through the levels, but like, isn't, there's a place where the pagans go, right? So Socrates and Aristotle are hanging out in a place. Limbo. So then, does um, is that where Virgil? Hangs That's out? where Virgil lives, Most but it doesn't. Yeah, it's not but where he, he stays for this. He, he gets, gets to come, come out and give okay. a tour, and then he has to go back. Okay, cool. All right. So he guides him, and what we find out is that there are three primary divisions to hell that correspond to the three animals: the she wolf oh. or sins of incontinence, like loss of self control, and then the the sins of the lion or sins of violence and sins of the leopard, or sins of deception, right, lies. And those are the three levels. And going from the top or the least bad in hell all the way to the bottom. So loss of self-control, sins of violence, and then sins of deceit. I've often thought that about leopards. That they're they're liars. they're just liars. (laughs) Yeah. They're just duplicitous. Yep. Maybe it makes sense to me. Most cats are. (laughs) Is that true? Are you a dog person? No, I love. I actually love both. Oh, I don't think cats are duplicitous at all. I think they just vaguely hate oh, everything. Well, they just yeah, don't they, care. They, oh, they I thought care. it was more like an apathy of like. Yeah. No, I think the leopard is because it has spots, right? right. Yeah, it, it pretends to be itself. something it's not. It pretends to be. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So they start, and they first hit the vestibule, which is where the lukewarm Christians mm. go. Right. If you didn't oh, pick dang. a side, because you never stood for anything in on earth, you never stand for anything in death. Mm. And their punishment is they have to chase this flag around while being stung by bees. Oh. Right. Nothing pricked them to move when they mm. were alive. And they, there's, a, there's a flag, right? They have to chase something to stand for. And so they get a chase and everything. And then the rest of everybody kind of goes to the shore and is compelled by divine justice to try to want to get into hell for some reason. Mm-hmm. And they cross with... Does the vestibule count as hell? Sorry. Is that... It's outside hell. Okay. Right? Hell kicks them out. Heaven doesn't want them. And they're not in purgatory. So they're not in purgatory. They're not in purgatory. They don't have any chance of redemption. Oh, so they, they don't. just... They don't. No, they don't. Okay. So they just sort of stick outside and... Everything is horrible. There's got to the be a lot of people in there then. There's a lot of people in there. Are there? There's a lot of people everywhere, yeah. oh. but there's a great multitude there. And I think there Dante passes out. Dante passes out a lot in this book. He gets scared and then he'll pass out oh. or he'll get tired and pass out or, you know, whatever. It's he terrifying. spends it a lot is. of time passing out. So they come to the shore and they go across with the help of Caron, the boatman, or I think it's pronounced Karen, but Karen is not Poor very Karen. flattering. Karen, yeah. 
Uh, and he's one like of the your coolest. Neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's got wild hair and fiery eyes. And he's like, I'm going to get you, you sinner. And then when Virgil's like, actually, he's a living man and you have to get, take us across and you can't hit anybody with your paddle, he gets all sour and grumpy because he doesn't like ferrying good, you know, alive people. Just like Karen. Yeah, just like Karen. All right, so I, they get I across. Hadn't, I hadn't thought about this, but is Dante not in danger as he goes into this? Oh, he's absolutely oh, in so danger. So he could be, um, he could be hurt. He could be mm-hmm. okay, okay. There are a few spots where he gets into some serious danger, but this isn't an adventure story. Right. Like if you've ever, there is a video game that came out a few years ago about Dante about him delving into hell to rescue Beatrice. Oh, oh wow! And it's it's not good. The, at all. There was a Robin Williams movie about that. Uh, what dreams? What may, dreams may, may come? come? Yeah, yeah, kind of the same thing. Yeah, right. It's, this is why we do the good. podcast. It's so that we can put proper <laughs> classical education into the world. In context, yeah. So we can have the video games we deserve. <laughs> can you imagine this video game would just be like walking from level to level, and right? You, and, and, level you and you take note of a new thing. And you take note oh, of a new thing. You pass out. The, entire, like, uh, the screen goes inferno. blank every yeah. sort of three or four cantos. Yeah, there's no monster bosses. It's just your own sin that you must Whoa. master. This is old Roman talking to you the whole time. Can we time. make this game? This is a good idea. Yeah. Right. Anyway. We do. So he, in ninth grade English. <laughs> in our minds. <laughs> so Dante fanboys on Virgil really hard. He's a really big Virgil fan. So after they cross, they, the first place they stop is Limbo and that's where the virtuous pagans go. They didn't believe in God. They have no chance of ever getting there. And But, you know, they're not so bad. And so this is where all the big poets are, Homer, uh, Ovid, Horace. I think there's a few of them. And Don, eventually... What about, like, the philosophers, like Socrates, there's Plato? Yeah, there's, there's, that's where they go. And there's... So he sees Homer and, and Homer's buddies, and it's Homer, Ovid, Lucan, and Horace... And Homer, like, waves him over, <laughs> and he's like, hey, buddy. And then he's like, and I was counted fifth among their number. So in his own book, he puts himself on the same <laughs> level of Homer and Ovid and it. Virgil. He's writing the book. He can do whatever he wants. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's smart. so he's yeah. like, they welcomed me in like a brother. And it's just the cheesiest thing in the world. You got to take your shot. That's right. But the thing is, it's true, though. I mean, he is. He is, and it. <laughs> like actually, right. so is it actually? Pr- it sounds sort of like he's being prideful, but is it pride to recognize like true talent? True talent, and part yeah, of it was I that he know. was it's writing. Kind of, it's kind of weird to call himself fifth in that list. Yeah. I don't know. No, sorry, sixth. Or I whatever. It is. But all, all that to say, like uh, for him to say, this is this thing I'm putting out. I put a lot of time into it. And it's pretty good. That's okay. Yeah, but you ever heard of Lucan? No, I mean, sorry. like I'm just saying. We know. I, mean, I think they were big then. It's like I mean, putting out a rap album and be like <laughs> Jay Z and. Uh, and why am I blanking on it? Kanye, Kanye. welcomed me, yeah. and they say I'm one of their own. And I feel like <laughs> okay. Kanye would be like, really, buddy? <laughs> you think? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so they go past the virtuous pagans, and they actually delve into hell proper where people are punished. So they hit the circle of the lustful, where we find Achilles, because there's a couple different versions of how Achilles died. One of them was that he lusted after a Trojan princess oh. and was assassinated at their wedding. So he's he should. Oh, that's real different. He yeah. should definitely be in the circle of the wrathful. It's totally. just that's what that's the, the version story of the story Dante, Dante knew. So would Dante not have read Homer? I, I actually don't think it was likely that he had, he read a good translation hmm. of Homer. Oh, interesting. Even though so, but Homer's is BFF. I mean, they still knew about okay. Homer. Yeah. Okay, so he. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and then they talk to. Uh, some people, Francesca and Paolo, and I'm trying to hit the highlights here. I swear I'm not going to do every ring yeah. by ring, but I love that story. Francesca and Paolo, she like they were sitting and she was reading together, and she was married in life, in in actual like these were real people. These are real people. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, this isn't a story. Dante, okay. for the most part, he he puts some literary characters in there, and he puts a lot of real actual mm. people in there. For the rule was, yeah. yeah, the rule was that you had to have been dead by the year 1300 when the book takes place. But didn't, I thought there was a live person in there. There's there's like one, okay. and he actually says, what you have done is so bad that your soul dropped into hell, oh. and your body has been possessed by a demon, and it is still walking around. Wow. And so I wonder if that guy got a copy of the book and was like, <laughs> oh no, who oh, this is not good for PR. <laughs> but yeah, there's for the most part, like sometimes if he knew someone would die in like 1306, he'd have the people in hell predict their death. Oh, If it came out this year, we'd put in people that have died in the last... Yeah, in the last so many years, and they could even predict the coming of like when Kanye dies, <laughs> dies he will he will be here in the circle of the prideful or whatever. Sure, sure. All right, so they were sitting and they were reading together, hmm. and they were reading about Lancelot and Guinevere, and they were like they would read a little bit and then look each other in the eyes and blush and start breathing heavily and then read a little more. And this was a racy book. Hmm. It was not okay for a woman and a man that wasn't her husband to be reading this 
alone. But she paints the picture like it's not her fault. She's like, it was the book. And then he kissed me. And then my husband jumped out from behind the drapes and killed us both, which oh. is actually what happened. Wow. And this has been, the reason I say this is because this scene has been repeated again and again and again in art, right? It's been painted so many times. And Dante falls for this, mm. right? He's like, oh, it's so sad that you both have to die. But really, they're not having a good time. She right. refers to Paolo as this one. She never says his name. He just kind of stands there and cries. Mm. And part of their punishment is that they have to be together forever mm. because of one moment of lust. They didn't actually like each other. Wow. They were just lusting. And their punishment is they have to get blown around in a whirlwind just as we are swept up by lust. Does Virgil correct Dante or does Dante realize he's wrong? We see a progression of Dante from the beginning to the end of having different progressively rea different reactions huh. to the sin, right? Okay. These people deserve to be here. Mm. This is divine justice. God has put them here for a reason. He is never wrong. They are receiving just punishment for their deeds. And at first, Dante's sympathetic. And Virgil yells at him a few times. And he really? says, dude, you got to get it together. If you stand here and listen to this anymore, I'm going to freak out. And there's actually a sort of a string of scholars that say Dante himself participates in the sin in every ring. Uh -oh. He will do something that sort of implicates himself to say that, you know, because he represents all of us, like none of us are innocent mm -hmm. of these things. Wow. Right. So he talks to Paolo and then they move on. They go to the gluttons, which we've talked about in a previous episode, right? It's consuming so much that you other people go without. And they're the, because they had so much comfort in life, they sort of lay down and get rained on mm -hmm. and a dog barks at them. And it's just uncomfortable generally. And that's where we meet Kerberos, the three-headed dog. Yeah. And they sort of throw some slime down his mouth and he chomps on it. <laughs> and then we meet the hoarders and the spendthrifts. So people that hoarded their money and people that spended their money. And they spend most of the time yelling at each other and rolling big rocks about, around mm -hmm. in a big circle. And this is where he talks a little bit about philosophy and fortune and how <laughs> fortune doesn't really care if you're a good man or a bad man. It's true. Money moves around. That's where the wheel of fortune comes from. And that's fortune. Boethius. He's getting yeah. that from Boethius. Yeah. Or so who's getting it from, like, just... We should do a podcast on fortune. Who's getting it from, you know, antiquity where fortune was this thing that it's just, yeah, fortune's really interesting. Fortune was this. Chance um, or luck is an external arbitrary force. Is that? Uh, uh, different. Okay. Fortune was a, fortune an actual was like, goddess. was like a okay. goddess. And her job was basically to stir the waters so that they don't get stale. So hmm. you're in the sun today. Well, you're not going to be in the sun tomorrow. You could lose all your fortune. And, uh, and, and fortune doesn't care. Fortune's just doing her job. She's just stirring the waters so that like. Right. She's whimsical. She don't yep. care about you. Mm -hmm. And she's always depicted with a wheel, which is where we get the, the wheel, wheel of fortune. Of fortune. Mm -hmm. um, her name, her uh, name translates to Vanna White. <laughs> yes, <I don't laughs> yes, yes. Okay, and then we get to the wrathful and the slothful. The <laughs> wrathful. Jack was a <laughs> demiurge. <laughs> the wrathful and the slothful sort of tackle each other in a giant river of poop and bite each other and tear each other. And Dante sees a guy dunked here. It's really funny. The guy's like, "Hey, I knew you." And Dante's like, "Oh, I want to dunk that guy." And so he does. Like, go ahead. This is his punishment. Yeah. It's not cruel. This is what this guy deserves. Mm -hmm. So he dunks him good. And it's kind of awesome. And the slothful just lay underneath the muck and just sort of let bubbles come up. They don't really do anything. Mm -hmm. And then they go to the city of Dis, which is the heretics. And they are all burned in tombs with everyone who believed in their heresy. And this is sort of outside of our divisions, right? Of incontinence, the she-wolf, violence, and fraud. Mm -hmm. It's between incontinence and violence. Okay. The right? city? Yes, the mm -hmm. city of Dis. It's like and a big heresy. wall. Yeah. And they try to keep him out. They're like, you won't go past. And then an angel comes down and he's like, for reals, and like blows the door open. And he's like, don't do it again. And then he like walks off trying to keep the poop out, smell out of but his But don't nose. they, when they see the city, don't they see that there's a giant breach in the walls of the city of Dis? And then, then they talk about when Christ came down to hell and saved everybody. So not necessarily a breach in the walls. The walls are still standing, mm -hmm. but you can see that there is a big like gash where the angel came down and he's the only one that can move rocks. Everybody else just walks around, doesn't change anything. They're gotcha. just shades. Huh. But the angel comes down and he's like, let him through. We've been through this before and you guys paid for it last time, remember? Wow. And we meet some furies and some harpies that are a mirror of the three heavenly ladies, which is I think St. Lucia, Beatrice, and Mary. Okay, so moving on. So the three divisions, right? We've just finished with incontinence, which is loss of self-control. And all of the monsters we've met are primarily animals, right. like Kerberos, that sort of thing. And my freshmen always have a really hard time with this because he's making some statements about what sins are bad and what sins are okay. And in this mm -hmm. version, being a liar is worse than being a tyrant or a murderer, mm -hmm. right? 
so long as you didn't betray them before you murdered them. And my, my freshmen always have a really hard time about that, time with that. But I think that because one of the- Because they're liars more than they are tyrants. <laughs> <Murderers. laughs> I don't think that's it. Oh. I think it's just because what we punish most severely it's in true. the justice system is murder, right? right? Mm-hmm. But that's not, in God's eyes, that's not necessarily the worst, right. right? You can fly into a passion and kill somebody when really what caused that was your love for your wife and you found her cheating or something. Right. Or maybe you just lose control every now and again. The state of the person's soul is not necessarily bad, right? Sins of incontinence, of being swept away by your own animal lusts, it's just natural, mm. right? We all lust. No, no, fallen natural, Fallen natural, yeah. right? But it is our nature mm-hmm. currently, yeah. and we are we are swept we are all swept away by them. And I can be swept away by lust and not have an evil intent in my soul at all. Okay, but maybe, maybe this is a question for after we've gone through all the things. But what makes a sin of um, lust, for example, uh, something that is hell worthy? versus those in purgatory. So the difference between those in hell and those in purgatory is that those in purgatory were believers, Mm -hmm. right? And then they still have sin, and then they have to be purged of that sin before going to heaven. But Paolo and Francesca presumably were baptized Catholics. Apparently not. Apparently they weren't believers one way or the other, right? It just just makes me think of the Adequatio episode of that there's consciousness which animals have, and um, so... Each of us on this podcast also teach a, a leadership class for the high school, and we're reading through Mere Christianity. I don't know if you all started. We are. Me, yeah. Okay. Yes. But I'm following the lesson plans of everybody else. <laughs> is what I meant to say. To so. everybody who is listening to this podcast who are my boss. But but so uh, so having these, he talks about this um, moral law, but like that we have reactions, that we have emotions is not a wrong thing in and of itself. Like there's something in right. us that has that emotion. But then we as so an animal would just act on that immediately. And these early sins are making ourselves animal-like. They're punished by animals as well. It's that they're not human. So th- whereas an animal will have a reaction, humans can look at that and say, I want to do one thing, but I choose to do another thing. And those people in the first levels just chose not to. So the right. appetitive soul, you yes. have these emotional things that bubble up from the sort of animal, animal side. side of the human person, yeah. and you don't censor them. You just do right. them. Now, I was actually going to say, I think these sins correspond to the three divisions of the human soul. Yeah. Now, did the, so did the three layers correspond to... I think so. Well, number one is appetites, A- appetites right? They are sure. sins of your appetites. Mm-hmm. You, you are taken, and you can't keep yourself from doing it. And the same things animals do, and... The intent of your soul is not necessarily evil, right? Mm-hmm. You can know a lot of really good people who are totally lustful or really good people who are gluttons right. and they just can't, they can't kick it and they might try the, their best, right? And then after that, through the city of dis or heresies, which are a sin, sin of intellectual pride, which is, un, which is typically understood to be outside of the three divisions, we get into the sins of violence. The, the river Phlegathon or the river of blood, the wood of suicides, which is where if you commit suicide, you go. And it was understood by the church that that was a, that was a sin that would instantly condemn you to hell. Um, and then the burning sand, which is for sins of, man, I'm forgetting the word for it, uh, sodomy, mm. sins of sodomy, right? So very unnatural sins. And you would just lie on this burning sand and fire would come and rain on you, right? And these are sins of violence, right? Where we are not just maybe harming ourselves by eating too much or being swept away by lusts, but we are actively harming others. And it seems to me that this corresponds to the The, will, right? The spirit. I am too spirited and so I hurt people. Or uh, I don't have enough spirit and perhaps that's what put me in the wood of suicides. And the wood of suicides is awfully tragic, right? Mm -hmm. If you commit that sin, you are thrown there and you sprout like a tree and your body hangs in your branches because something that you cast off in life is not given back to you in death. Uh, and I think today we would understand suicide with a little more grace and sympathy. But but back then, right, it was seen as refusing a, a gift, gift that, that God, God had given you, yeah. given you yeah. and ultimately despair, despairing of God's grace and the sufficiency of his love in order to save you, right? Saying God is not enough for me. He cannot get me through this hard thing that I'm going through. And the trees can talk, right? When he's there, doesn't he like take a leaf off and the tree screams at him? The way that you talk to a tree is by snapping a branch off and it feels to the tree like you are snapping off a limb. And so part of their punishment is that there's some dogs that run around and break all the Mm. branches and Mm. chase some dudes. And there's harpies that, you know, eat parts of the trees and it's pretty terrible. Because they're half birds. They sit in the trees. Yeah. So that's kind of terrible. But again, I think it corresponds to the spirit, right? You are maybe overly spirited. 
And or, then, or underspirited. You yeah, don't have enough. Or underspirited, yeah, yeah. right. And then, so these are sins against others, sins against the self, and then sodomy would be sins against nature, right? Mm-hmm. The way that we are supposed to be. All right, and then we move down and we go into the sins of fraud. And the, the monster that's the symbol of this is Geryon. Mm-hmm. And he's got an honest man's face. Oh. He looks very honest and good. His fur is all curly cues. Wait, wait, he's got wait, these big lion's back paws. Back up. I'm sorry. Wait, with the fur? Was, you want to talk about like, that for a second? You got me with honest face and you <laughs> lost me with fur. <laughs> so he's, the, he's this like weird conglomeration. And from the front, he looks like kind of like a lion. He's got lion paws mm-hmm. and this fur. And it's all in curly cues and arabesques. And it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And he compares it to like nice rugs. And then he's got this on his face. And then on the back, he's got a, a scorpion stale, oh. like a, a scorpion stinger yeah. mm. on a snake tail. Mm. Wow. So you, he it's looks like the, so honest and he's all real good until he, you know, he gets you. It's like the worst mascot for like a sports <laughs> yeah. team. Uh, there's, there's been times when I'm like, we should have pull a mascot from old things. But every time we've tried to pull a mascot, it ends up being horrible. It means like, a terrible, terrible thing. Have, did we tell you about the questing beast? Were you here for no, that? No. So in ancient Arthurian literature, there's this beast that is, he's like half big snake, half leopard. What they think is that they saw a giraffe and didn't know how to describe it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it's got like barking dogs in its tummy and what it's really world? weird. And there's this guy like, I will find the questing beast for he's, it is my he's quest. He's called the questing beast because you got a quest to find him. Yeah. So you wanted... We wanted that to be our mascot. Wouldn't the, that be amazing? The Veritas mascot. Yeah. yeah. Which we thought was awesome. And then we found out that the questing beast had to do with like... Incest? It represents <laughs> all of the, yeah, the yeah. horrible things in our theory. Like all the incest in the families and the murder and the betrayal is all represented in this quest. So we probably beast. didn't want to wrap the school's, you know, branding. In, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In the Good quest, choice. In the questing beast. Or else we'd have to go and do some serious editing on that Wikipedia page <laughs> <laughs> and hope that they're cool with it. Although the questing beast think, is great. If you can think of a great classical beast that can be the Veritas mascot, let us know. Because right now we are just... The defenders. We're the defenders, which is cool. Yeah. But... That but you know de- how, like, so for example, like a hockey team or has, <laughs> maybe you guys don't know this. You know all about but hockey But for example, yeah. the Toronto Maple Leafs, like, they are the Maple Leafs, but their mascot is a polar bear that mm. just wears a Maple Leafs jersey. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, I mean, like, you know, the mascot doesn't have to be the name of the team. So we could be the Veritas Defenders and our mascot could be, like, it shouldn't just be like a, you know, anthropomorphized sword or something. But, but the Well, pe- right, right now it can be depicted so many ways. Yeah. Like a knight, a fence. A fence. Yeah. Oh, yep. De- defense. But, uh, or just like rubber gloves. They do defend. They do defend. Or yeah. like just Clorox wipes. Are, are, are the beasts only in um, hell or mm. do they, are there also beasts in purgatory or? I don't remember any beasts in purgatory. I no, there are I, no, I would imagine I that there are there no animals beasts in purgatory. Point. Yeah. That would be the other problem of picking a classical animal is that they're all from hell, mm-hmm. according to Dante. So Yeah. So anyway, they hit the bottom, yeah. and they go over all these little ditches, or bolgia. They're like, it looks like a big tiddlywinks board. You mm. guys ever played tiddlywinks? Yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, so it's just like concentric I circles. I don't know what you're talking about. They're little, they're little ditches, and mm. they kind of have to go over all these bridges. And the monsters here, uh, sorry, the monsters in the violence are like half man, half animal. This mm. is where we see centaurs. And then once we hit fraud, they actually become just very deep. human, little devils, oh. right? And this is where we have panders and seducers, flatters, simonists, sorcerers, hypocrites, thieves, deceivers, sowers of discord, uh, falsifiers, which are guys who minted fake money. Yeah, usurers. We're going to talk about that in a couple episodes. Get excited. <laughs> yeah. So this is where all those guys all kind of reside. And each one has a different punishment. I won't go through all of them. But the idea here is that even though one man may have murdered, it is a greater sin to be a liar and someone who continuously deceives other men because it takes forethought. It reaches the, mm. hi- the highest parts of your soul. <laughs> it reaches your reason. You need to intend to do it. I bring you in, I fake something, and I, I re- you know, put bad things on you to make good things happen to me. So if that resulted in you also murdering me, you would get put into the lower circle of hell for your deception or for your lying than yeah. for your murder? I think it's... Uh, you, I mean, I assume that Achilles had a lot of sins, right. but you are put somewhere because of the, the sin that most defines your the life. The besetting sin. I was yeah, say, we talked about besetting sin last time. Besetting sin. The primary one is what puts you in your level. The is sin, that right? The thing that sort of centrally you cannot shake. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And then they finally get to the bottom. And by the way, it's it's not all fire down here. It's mostly just like ice? a cave. Oh. Yeah. And then when they hit the bottom, all of the rivers of hell have been, there's a, there's a part where it describes that they came down a statue and it's that the tears of oh. sin flowing down through the year, the wow. different ages of man make the different rivers. There's the Acheron, which is in the vestibule. And then there's the river of poop or the Styx. There's the river of blood, the Phlegathon. And Wait, then they all- Styx is a river of poop? Yes. I will. That, I will. That changes the way I will listen to that band. From Every now time. On. That's, I did not realize. Great. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> 
And then they get Roboto, is the Mr. Roboto is my go-to at karaoke night. <laughs> but now you're only going to be able to I think know, of that. I can't. Yeah. It's ruined. Sorry. So we hit the bottom, and they some giants take them, and they put them down on what is, at the very bottom, a sea of ice. Mm. And it's really windy, and it's really cold. And the idea is that... Ah, uh, so home hell, sweet home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell has <laughs> frozen that, over. That, yeah. It already happened, boys. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because they are the furthest one can possibly get from God's light and warmth, mm-hmm. right? This is where God is not. And this is where the, the biggest deceivers are, the betrayers, the betrayers of kindred or family, the betrayers of country, the betrayers of guests, which we see as kind of a theme in ancient literature, mm-hmm. right? Hospitality was really important. And then betrayers of your lords. So even betraying my family was not as betr- bad as betraying a lord-subject relationship. Yeah. And so we finally meet Satan. I bet the ninth graders have a hard time with that one too. They do. Yeah. Uh, we finally meet Satan. He's got three faces and he is chomping on three sinners. Brutus, Cassius, Judas. and Judas. Right, so people who have f- were famous for betraying their lords, uh, and and then they—he's not malignant to them. He doesn't like want to hurt them. He's just sort of flapping to try to get out of where he is. And then so they climb down his legs, and then they ca- they've kind of passed through the center of the earth because that's where Satan is lodged, right in the middle of the earth, mm-hmm. like a worm in an apple that is sending oh. rottenness out from the core. Right, that's kind of what he's doing. Yeah. Then they climb out and they find themselves at the bottom of purgatory. How does that? Sorry, he goes down. And then passes through. Is he in the center of the earth at this point? The Satan is lodged right in the center of the earth. So how do you so, go from center of earth to? His, does he pass through the rest of the super earth? Super long to legs. The bottom of the mountain. So I'm sorry. They they well they've been in hell and hell is right. just this big crater all the so way to the center of the down, earth. And then they suddenly go. And up. then they climb on. They get like grab onto Satan's haunches. Yeah. And then climb down a little ways. And then right when they hit the center, he sort of like rotates <laughs> and then climbs back up. And Dante's really confused. He's like. Man, I I was looking at his face, and now I'm looking at his legs, but everything is still, like, right side up. So he's really confused about what happened, and Virgil has to explain it. Haven't you seen Looney Tunes where they, like, go down, and then the screen flips over, and then they come up, and they're they're on the other side of the world? It's exactly like that. Looney Tunes is where I get my cosmology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they went into hell on Good Friday, and they come out of hell the same day Jesus did, which Mm. would be Easter. And then they journey up purgatory, and purgatory is for those... Who, who have hope of redemption but need to have their sins tortured out of them, sort of, and you go up level by level until everything is gone. They hit the top of that. He has a chat with Beatrice who takes over, and Virgil, who represents human reason, is not allowed to come mm. into heaven. Wow. He can't. He's barred. Yeah. And that's to say that human reason can only get us so far, right? And it can't take us into heaven, right? That takes faith. Yeah. So he has to stay behind. And then Beatrice takes him the rest of the way. The Inferno is what I'm most familiar with and could, could walk you through. The cool but. thing about purgatory is that um, you can see it even as like a manual for how to deal with the specific sins. Because, oh, see if I can remember this. When they're in purgatory, they are given a, uh, a rod and a yoke is sort of a way hmm. to think about it. So their punishment, they, they, they are punished. And that punishment, there's a rod. So they get sort of punished in proportion to the sin that they've done. But they're also given a yoke. They're given like a burden that they have to do that will train them in the virtue that they have lacked. Mm. So the only one that I can remember is the one of lust, which is right at the top of purgatory. And so the rod is that they are in burning fire. Uh, because in, in life they burned, and so in purgatory they have burned, and they also have to burn away their desires. But the, but the yoke that they're given, the thing that they're supposed to do to train them in the proper virtue, is that they have to listen to proper stories of actual good, redemptive, holy love. So stories of men who've loved women in righteous ways, stories of like proper friendship, stories mm-hmm. of charity that are that are pure and good, and they have to listen to those stories and memorize and, and learn those stories. And then at a certain point, um, the lust is burned away and they've been trained in love and then they can go into heaven. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure that every single step has that rod yoke relationship mm-hmm. and you can even go into it and you can, like, some people have even credited it as like a field manual for how to deal with specific sins. If yeah. you are someone who loves money, well, go to the money purgatory place and, and see how they deal with it. Yeah, Dante's intention in writing the comedy was to help everyone come to a greater faith, 
right? We are, like he was, exiles from our true home, which is heaven. Mm. And he's exiled from Florence. And so he also gets to throw a bunch of Italian politics in there. And when you read it, you can skip over a lot of the Italian <laughs> dudes. You don't need to worry about that yeah. as much. It's kind of interesting when you look up some of their who stories and who they were and what they did. That's all you, really interesting. And if interesting. you ever go to Florence, I've never been to Florence. AJ, I know you've been to Florence. I have. But if you go to Florence, I think they've done a pretty good job of like pointing out like here's this dude's house who is yeah. the guy that talked that uh, Dante talked about in Purgatory. They have there's actually a big statue of Dante and Dante <clears throat> always looks just so pissed. He looks, <laughs> he looks so mad. Time. It's because he's been exiled and he's not happy. And again and again, Florence have tried to get his body. I think his body's in Ravenna. Mm. And they've tried again and again and again and again. And Ravenna's like, you didn't want him in life. We're not <laughs> giving him, him back in death, so which is so good. <laughs> so he's, he's trying to bring us as exiles back to our home. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. would know he was an exile. And so he brings this story you know, home to you in your heart as much as he can. And he writes in the four levels, just like scripture that we talked about, the literal, the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical. So he has all these levels of symbolism going on in his head as he writes. And one last comment about the structure of things, Satan is at the center of the earth because of how hard he fell from heaven, Mm. right? He fell like a meteor. And when he hit, it dug all of hell out like a big crater. It's actually this big V-shaped crater and it hasn't really changed since Satan fell. And then he got stuck in the middle of the earth and that's where he's been ever since, Mm -hmm. right? Just sitting right in the middle of earth, making everything rotten from the center. And then, so they go through hell and then they go up purgatory and purgatory is the mountain Mm -hmm. that came out the other side (laughs) when he He hit so hard. So it's just like a big and it just drew, drove all the, I hit my microphone with my hands, <laughs> drove it all the way out the other side. And so he gets to go through and then climb up the mountain and then head into the stars. Does paradise have three concentric rings? Are there like people who are, in, who are in paradise who did really great at acts of charity, but they're lower in paradise than people who've done acts of bravery? Or does there's it have level, that kind of levels other in, levels? There's still paradise? levels, but I'm, I'm not as positive yeah. on the structure. I know hell way more than I know the other ones. Yeah. Just like most everyone does. Yeah. You're, the, you're a hard living guy. Hang guys, <laughs> it's, the, it's the fun one. It and it's the funny one. Have you, have you read the Purgatory? I've read Purgatory. I've read most of Paradise. But it's boring. Oh, it's I've so read boring. Paradise, I think last time was an undergrad. Yeah. And I remember being like, he's like, it was the best thing ever. And then I got to the next level. And it was even, <laughs> even better. better. And that happens... Every ring. He's like, if I thought I knew bliss before, it was nothing compared to this new bliss. Yeah. It's now this could be out of squashio or whatever that word was um, yeah, coming yep. back. And the, the it could be a problem. We last time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It could be a problem with us not loving paradise because Your mind we, not to the our mind has not gram. conformed to the object. I don't know, but oh man, it's so boring. Pew, 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 pew. <laughs> so if you if you are feeling compelled to read, it's don't, okay don't, or, to oh. just read the Inferno and stop. Right? I don't think so. I, I, I think purgatory purgatory, purgatory purgatory is great. It yeah. really is. But I'd say most of the educated world has read the Inferno. Right? That's that's the one that's really popular. I feel like we got to get to the place where we want heaven. Mm. That's what I was thinking about. That like, is it that it's more exciting to read about hell? Yeah. And I don't know. I think does that reflect it, something in us of well, I was going to say, I think it does, right? When C.S. Lewis wrote the Screw Tape Letters, it was a, ideally going to have a companion book yeah. wh- written from an elder angel, angel to a younger angel. And he's like, but I couldn't do it. Right. Every sentence would have to drip with perfection and honey. And I, I just can't write that. And I think for us to just hear about only happiness doesn't connect as well with our souls because mm-hmm. that's not what we are, at least not yet. Yeah, I don't know. It just... It's kind of, it makes me sad that I don't want to read the Paradiso as much as I want to read the Inferno. I don't know. Like, I'm not as excited about reading about that Dante's attempt at perfection as I am about the Inferno or even the Purgatory, Purgatorio. I don't know. I think it means something. I don't know. Yeah. No, no, it's like you want to watch the bad guy movie. Right. Well, we talked about this with superheroes that... Um, no, I don't want to watch those movies. Sorry, I know you don't, but like a, a level of grit makes a superhero movie more relatable. No, it doesn't. Oh, sorry. Okay. I mean, on. people... Yeah. Uh, whatever. It, does though, no, it doesn't it though? <laughs> Angry, sad Superman is better than like. Happy... I'm not saying better, but like um, more people watch it. Maybe is what I'm saying. I guess. Yeah, whatever. We we identify with a Superman who is having difficulties more than we ide- identify with just a perfect a, per- a Superman who's like, and that has worked out perfectly. Yeah. I have prevented another crime. But his name is Superman. Yeah, yeah, but that doesn't 
Make him always happy, Graham. <laughs> there, there's also a line of comics where instead of Superman landing in U.S., he lands in the USSR. Have you all seen this? And no. So, yeah, he's like defending communism is another. Yeah, it's one of the alternate universes of Superman. That anyway. sounds awesome. See, because you want to read that one and not like the he's a super he's a great guy for. I don't know. See, he can meet his quotas. Superman can meet his quotas <laughs> could, for absolutely. yep for the party. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. So to wrap it all up, Dante, can, can, can I ask a question. Yeah. Does um, I don't know. This you question. thought you were getting out of this audience. No, you're not. <laughs> Does Dante think this is like actually how it is? Like this is how hell is? I don't know. Oh, I don't think that he was actually putting down theology. He so put like a ton reading, of people down there. Yeah. He was claiming where everyone would go because of their besetting sin. I think his intention was to show us what sins are actually bad in the human soul. Because I think we misunderstand them. Yeah. We think that the violent ones are the ones that hurt the most other people. But that's the thing is... God's not concerned with how many other people we hurt. He's right. concerned with where your soul is when mm-hmm. it makes the decision to sin. Yeah. And violence is sometimes a lot easier to, of a decision to make mm-hmm. than fraud and deceiving someone else and deciding to hurt them and then carrying that out, right? Yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I think he was ma- trying to make a statement more about who we are and our journey to faith rather than he was saying, like, I am pretty this sure this is how it is. Because yeah. he included all kinds of pagan things, too, right? We got Caron, the boatmaster, who, by the way, is even present in the oldest book we have, Gilgamesh. Oh. He's, he's, he's in all, everything Car on the Boatmaster is. Wow. And like he, he shows up all the time. That's why we should read the classics, so we can understand those references. In Gilgamesh, he actually has to explain to Gilgamesh why the boat won't work after Gilgamesh tears it apart. <laughs> Gilgamesh is like, why can't, you, why can't you sail me over? He's like, listen, Gilgamesh, <laughs> you broke my the boat thing over. you broke yeah. is the thing that lets my boat sail. And he's like... <laughs> I still don't get it. <laughs> he's, still, he's like, why are you mad at me, boatman? He's like, you wrecked my boat. It's great. Uh, so he shows up all the time. And so I don't think he was making any statements about, about like the actual structure of hell. But he definitely, like the, the cosmos yes. was the medieval belief right. of how the cosmos worked. So maybe not the actual nitty gritty hell components of, of the, you know, the, the nine layers or whatever. Um, but definitely the idea of the spheres and the mm-hmm. prima mobile and all those sorts of things they would have believed. What's, yeah. What's prima mobile? Uh, the unmoved mover. God, oh. uh, it's still the... It's where you get all the way outside the spheres and you sort of get into the realm of pure thought and that's where God lives. Okay. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it is not moving just like how the center of a wheel is not moving hmm. and everything revolves around it. Sure. And the farther away you get from it, the faster motion there is. Okay. And so in that sense, like Satan is the farthest away from God. And so he should be the one that's whipped around the most. But, but I don't think Dante in, talks about that. He's frozen in place. He's frozen he? in place. But he's frozen in place. But in relation to being far from God, he's at the edge of the wheel. So presumably he's it's spinning around the, sure. the quickest. But I think, I mean, I don't know if that's... I don't think Dante the way they, does under, that. They, mm-hmm. they understood how the wheels moved, the things that were closest to God would have moved quite a bit because they were moving so many thousands of miles. No, we could, but they're but they're closer to the center. So as they get closer to the center, they move sort of more slowly and harmoniously. I I don't know. Earth Earth is not the center. Earth is not the center. Okay. No, I thought it was the center. Yeah, Earth is the center. It's just it's at the think of it more like being at the bottom of the garbage can. It's the worst bits okay. that didn't get used in the creation of everything else. And it's it earth. falls to the bottom. So, That's earth. Yeah, so Satan is the ultimate trash. He's the thing that was tossed out of the good stuff, which is the heavens. Huh. This, is, this is awesome. Cool. Yeah. Okay, uh, stuff we got wrong. We had one we continuously My, my microphone? You want me to talk about it? Oh, oh. no, I wasn't oh, going to talk oh. about the microphone. I mean, we do everything professionally. That's and what I meant to say. Sorry. always pointed the or right you, direction. I, yeah, I'll do mine another time. What's yours? <laughs> I mean, you can. I was going to say we pronounced Augustine. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, I... Uh, I had a few people contact me on this one, so thank you. Uh, the, yeah, the, appreciate it. The, uh, the town in Florida is Augustine, and I hear it's lovely. The saint from uh, Christian tradition is Augustine, so I'm totally still going to mix the two. But Well, this, the problem is, is that Veritas, we have houses, and one of the houses is House Augustine. But it's not. And everybody... It's the house of Augustine. Oh. It is. Well, I'm, going, I'm calling him Augustine then, because that's what I always did, and then everyone was like, Augustine... And I get a lot of flack for pronouncing you know things differently because I'm from back. a different country. You know, we're going we're gonna to take this one head on. Excellent. Yeah, yep. let's do this thing. All right, so that's something we got All wrong. Right, Augustine. If you enjoyed the podcast, you can always contact us at classicalstuff at veritasacademy.net. We also have a website, classicalstuff.net, and that'll be updated with episodes. You can check everything out there. If we ever have shirts, that's where we'll sell them. We have a Twitter. We, we, we tweet. Have at, we tweeted before? We have yeah. quoted. At um, 
Uh-huh. I can't remember what our at is. It's something like classical stuff, but with vowels removed because like classical s- stuff's already taken. But buddy. not all the vowels. Not all the vowels, just See, some of the vowels. I'm trying to pull it up. Um, anyway, so it that's... Is, uh, uh, we are at C-L-S-S-C-A-L stuff. Classical stuff. Classical stuff. And so tweet at us. We will We will tweet back. And then that will be what we do on the Twitters, because what else is it for? Maybe we can make some fun, uh, some fun classical jokes. We tried to get a flame war started with we some did. of the modern philosophers. Did it work? It didn't. Oh. Yeah. So our very first tweet. So you know how there's like Twitter accounts where it's just Immanuel Kant quotes over and over and over again. So I we tweeted at Immanuel Kant, "We're coming for you." So my my favorite Twitter account is Immanuel Kant Ye West, <clears throat> where they take. Immanuel Kant quotes and mix them with Kanye tweets. And there's also a one. Kim Kierkegaard Ashian. Kim I love Kierkegaard Ashian is really good. Mm-hmm. That's another one. And then another one is Justin Bieber, which is the philosopher <laughs> oh. Bieber and Justin Bieber. That's pretty <laughs> it, awesome. You guys, they I are know. so good. You got to check them out. So that is classical stuff okay. you should know. We thank you for listening to our Spring Break podcast. Woo! Spring Break podcast. Woo! And we're headed um, to the beach. So we're going to the beach. We're nope. um, no, you know this isn't going to get. Oh, this is going to get published during spring break. It's, it's coming out. Right? Yeah, it's coming out tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. Happy spring break. So happy everybody. spring break, everybody. For our seniors that are on their Europe, tri- mm. Europe trip, um, we hope that you are enjoying listening to this on one of your bus rides. Yep. 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 <laughs> and we this is we will sign off. Yep. Sign off. Bye. Ciao. Nope, yep. Bye.